All right, uh, I'll open us in a word of prayer and then we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, it is so good to know that um, your spirit is with us. Your spirit is in us. Uh, Lord, we come here as people who are weak, who are tempted towards all sorts of anxiety and pride and all forms of, of inordinate desires. Lord, we are broken people who need to be rebuilt, and yet you're committed to doing that. Lord, you've told us uh, in the gospel that, that you will remake us. Lord, you have died for our sins, and you have uh, promised us that you will remake us into those who bear your image, uh, Lord, and that your spirit is a seal to that. Lord, we will live forever. Uh, tonight is just a, a short little moment in which we can peer forward uh, to that moment, uh, Lord, where we can look into where we've uh, come in our history, Lord, where we can uh, just see your character displayed in the history of redemption, uh, and Lord, we pray that tonight your spirit would work to convict us uh, of sin and righteousness and judgment. Uh, Lord, that your spirit would open our eyes to the things in your word, uh, that your spirit would, um, Lord, give us great wisdom and courage to not only fight sin, but to be bold witnesses for Christ. Uh, Lord, we know that, um, that we are loved and we know that the spirit is in us, that the spirit testifies to us with our spirits, that we are children of God. Lord, it's a sweet thing to be reminded of that. We pray that your spirit would be working here in accordance with your word, uh, Lord, that we would come away refreshed. Uh, Lord, we pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, well, welcome to our summer equipping series on pneumatology. So I think it was the last three years we've kind of been walking towards this. Uh, we had theology proper two years ago. We had Christology last year, and then now pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. So this is uh, working our way through the Trinity. Uh, this time will not be exhaustive. So I'll just come right out the gate and say we will have questions. There's all sorts of things we can dive into, but uh, this will be basically a general overview of the Holy Spirit to familiarize ourselves with how he works. So as you can see on the top of your sheet, uh, it is his person and his general operations. Uh, now preview, the next time we meet, uh, I won't be teaching, but it'll be on his work in salvation. Uh, and then the following time it will be his work uh, in basically giving us gifts. So it'll be kind of the, the three main categories that we're working with uh, will be those. But tonight we have the Holy Spirit's person in general operations. Uh, I'd just like to start with that quote right on that top of your note sheet. Uh, it says, as Sinclair Ferguson said, the Holy Spirit is sometimes considered the forgotten member of the Trinity. And yet, he goes on to say, the Christian experience is the fruit of the Spirit's ministry. It is the Holy Spirit who transforms bare head knowledge into experience of the power of the truth. So it's amazing to realize like our own experience of the Christian faith, even though we may gravitate, gravitate in a relationship or some sort of relational experience to the Father or to the Son, uh, our experience itself is had by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that is really interesting to think about. Um, but just to get us yeah, started there, the Christian experience is the fruit of the Spirit's ministry. Now, Question for you guys, and you guys can raise a hand, ask questions at any time also. Uh, what can we say, uh, why do you think the Holy Spirit is sometimes the forgotten member of the Trinity? Or why would somebody say that? Especially maybe in reform circles like ours. What could we say? Yeah, prayers are generally directed to the Father or the Son. Good. Other thoughts? Yeah, yeah, the Reformed theology is usually rightfully directed towards Christ. As we learn also in scripture, the spirit testifies of Christ and glorifies Christ. So there's a directionality there that points to Jesus. Um, what else? Why might we kind of like leave the Holy Spirit, uh, that topic aside? Go ahead. Yeah, make a distinction between us and charismatics, right? There's so much charismatic chaos out there. Uh, that, you know, it's something we can sometimes just kind of put to the side. We're like, okay, we don't want to be confused with those people, so we're just going to kind of like gravitate towards Christ or something like that, right? 
Um, when in reality, scripture does give us very clear guidance on the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about that tonight. So uh, my goal is to take us all snorkeling. I love snorkeling, but that's what we're going to do. We're not going to go diving. We're not going to go deep sea diving. This is going to be snorkeling. We're all going to be on the surface of the infinite ocean of God's character. <laughs> and the goal is that all of us get through this and nobody drowns. Okay, so that's the... The idea. Now, we're all familiar with uh, salvation. You know, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, I think we think in terms of salvation. Uh, but this is hopefully going to kind of like dilate our lens a little bit. So we see his work is much more encompassing than just salvation. So to start, and raise your hand at any time if you have a question. I'll also pause periodically throughout. The person of the Holy Spirit. So working through our notes here, the person of the Holy Spirit. Question, should we believe that the Holy Spirit is a person? Now, there's a context to this. Some of the Bible's language and imagery is non-personal, right? Even the word spirit is non-personal. It just means wind or air in motion. Uh, it's not something that's inherently personal like you would read in the Father or the Son, something that's more familiar to us. Uh, also, there's other images, gift, you know, the spirit being poured out. These are not usually words you use to describe a person. Jehovah's Witnesses take this to say that these kinds of pictures are evidence that, quote, the Bible shows that the Holy Spirit is not a person. And they would say that the Holy Spirit serves merely as the name of God's active force. So Jehovah's Witnesses would say the Holy Spirit is not a person. He, it is a force, right? So the Holy Spirit's not a person. It's a force. Um, what can we say to that? Well, we would just say, keep reading, right? Keep reading in our Bibles, because that's not the full picture. The Bible reveals the Holy Spirit is a person. So in addition to those word pictures, which are clearly word pictures, uh, even Christ in Isaiah is described as the uh, arm of the Lord. You know, obviously, uh, that's, that's a word picture there. The Holy Spirit is described as a divine person. Uh, in Acts 5, he is lied to, right? Ananias is uh, said to have lied uh, to Peter, and um, basically, you know, Peter says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And then he says, you have not lied to men, but to God, right? So second, he sends men. Third, he commands, he speaks, he advocates. These are all personal uh, ideas, personal language uh, used for the Holy Spirit. Now, in addition to that, it's interesting on the, the next page, the Holy Spirit, or at the bottom of that page, the Holy Spirit appears with masculine pronouns. Um, spirit is not a word in the Greek language that has gender, like feminine or masculine, but when Christ is describing the spirit with pronouns, he uses masculine pronouns. Uh, so it's really, it's more befitting to a person, uh, than a thing, for example. So the big, so what of it, the upshot is, uh, we should try to use, uh, he instead of it language. I know that's, I find myself getting caught on that all the time, uh, but I think it's just helpful to remind ourselves and kind of rework our brains to realize the Holy Spirit is a person. He uh, intercedes for us, right? Romans 8. Um, so, any questions on that? Pretty straightforward, but all right. We'll move on. Next, the Bible confirms the Holy Spirit is God. Right, just working through. We're in the shallow end. We're wading into our snorkeling waters right, of the ocean. The Bible confirms the Holy Spirit is God and the third member of the Trinity. He's obviously called God in Acts 5. Again, Ananias was moved to lie to the Holy Spirit. Peter said, you've not lied to men, but to God. Right? Parallel, clear indication that the Holy Spirit is God. Next, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18 says, now the Lord is the Spirit. And so it calls... Uh, the Spirit, the Lord, even at the end, from the Lord, the Spirit of that verse. So um, clearly called God, clearly called Lord, uh, indications that the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, and I think one of the best ones is next in the you know familiar Great Commission passage. Jesus says the Holy Spirit uh, is included in the divine name. So one name, you know, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of singular name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So one name, three persons, right? One God, three persons. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the third person listed under that name of God. Okay, so that's just kind of basic. Um, we're working through that. But 
Uh, moving on, the early church affirmed the Holy Spirit as a person uh, in the Nicene Creed in AD 381. I'll just read this. It's beautiful. It's well written. They said, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. So there's a lot of different categories there. We could piece that out. Um, but just wanted to highlight that as I mentioned to say the early church, the Orthodox Church, has affirmed the deity and the personhood of the Holy Spirit for a long time. Now, the main focus is, of course, what does Scripture say? We already established that. Um, but, yeah, just kind of saying the Holy Spirit's a person, the Holy Spirit's God, the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity. So, any general questions? It's kind of, kind of straightforward, but, okay. So, here's where we start to get into some deeper waters. Question, what distinguishes the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son? What distinguishes the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son? Uh, how is the Holy Spirit distinct? Why is it, uh, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Why isn't it the Father, the Son, and the Grandson? Why isn't it the Father, the Son, and the Daughter? Uh, God could have communicated in any which way, but why did he do that? Why is it Father, Son, and Spirit? Why, what is distinct about the Spirit um, that we should understand from that. I know we kind of gloss over that, like our God, and we kind of just get handed to us this Trinitarian formula of Father, Son, and Spirit. But I think tonight, one of the things I want to focus on is just looking at those titles and, and thinking about them. So why is the Holy Spirit distinct from the Father and the Son? There's kind of two answers here. Um, the first is a basic Bible answer. This is that he eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. Proceeding is usually the verb tied to the Holy Spirit. Uh, the reason is, if you take all the titles of the divine members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's words or verbal ideas attached to each title. So the Father eternally begets, like it is fathering the Son. Uh, the Son is eternally uh, begotten or fathered. And then the spirit is eternally proceeding. Uh, the fun word is spirating, like respirator, like spirit. Uh, that's the, the typical idea. So there's a, a, some sort of organization there, uh, and it's inherent in their titles. The father eternally begets the son as the father. The spirit, or the son eternally is begotten of the father as the son. The spirit eternally proceeds from both. Now that's reflected in an ancient creed and also a number of passages Remember Jesus said, you know, I'll ask the Father and he will give to you like another helper, right? Another advocate, another comforter. Uh, and then he says later, I will give him to you. And so the Spirit is coming from the Father and from the Son. And so that's where the basic Bible answer is to say that the Holy Spirit is distinct because, you know, he, he does not come uh, solely from the Father as the Son, or he does not come, um, you know, he is not the the primary, uh, in the order of the Trinity, the primary uh, person, as the Father is, but he is the one who proceeds from both of them. Now, I know that's, that's a lot, but um, that's just kind of the, the basic picture that Scripture would give us. Now, sort of helpful? Kind of helpful? Man, eh, not super helpful. Um, what I like about Jonathan Edwards is that he kind of just took that and stared at it. I just tried to like think about it. Um, like what's the significance of that, right? So this is where um, we're gonna do a little bit of free diving in our snorkeling trip. Uh, and there's something that might be a better Bible answer than the basic Bible answer. Um, now I submit this idea to you uh, with a pair of long tongs. <laughs> I do not necessarily hold this myself, uh, but I, I, I do like it and I do uh, want to commend it to you for inspection, but this is basically, um, I think, probably one of the better answers, as he's one of the few guys who has written on this. So, uh, how the Holy Spirit is distinct from the Father and the Son. Jonathan Edwards attempts to go further and kind of find, like, the so what of all of this. Uh, why, why does the Spirit proceed from the Father and the Son? Like, what's going on? Um, and so, he tries to answer this uh, following the general idea of Augustine, Edwards makes the case that the Holy Spirit is the bond of love between the Father and the Son. Really interesting. In other words, the Spirit is himself 
the love that surges in, through, and between the Father and the Son. So you have this language, right? Father, Son, and Spirit. Again, God could have uh, you know, organized it or revealed himself in any way, but why is there person, person, and then like wind? Why, why is there person, person, and wind in motion, or air in motion? Uh, why is it that way? Basically, um, he's going to say that the, you know, have you ever said like, oh, I just have a real spiritual bond with this person, right? Like we just, we just get each other. Uh, Edwards is basically saying that. He's saying between the Father and the Son, their union, their spiritual bond, is actually himself the third person of the Trinity. Now, I know that kind of like blows our minds because we don't think of spirits in that way. We don't think of our spiritual connection to each other in that way. Um, but in the Trinity, basically, what you have is the Father, who's a person, the Son, who's a person, and then... Um, in order for God to be love, in order for God to be love, uh, love, the love between the Father and the Son has to be God himself. And so it has to be a person, right? The love has to be personal. The love has to be the third person of the Trinity. Uh, because otherwise you have the Father, the Son, and then like exhaust fumes of, you know, something else that's not actually God. It's actually something outside of God. Um, so you have basically this not relationship that is really, really tight between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And he's basically tightening that and saying, the, the Spirit is himself the love that binds them. Okay, so hold your questions for just a second. We'll get through this, and then I'll open it up. According to Augustine, this quote says, the way to understand the Spirit's place in the triune Godhead is as the bond that binds the Father and Son together. The bond is love which is the very substance of God, and therefore love could serve as the title of the Holy Spirit. So, um, Jonathan Edwards, in order to make this case, has some really interesting points. And they're listed for you there, at least some of them. He says, there's never any mention in the Bible of the Holy Spirit loving anyone, including the Father and the Son. And yet, God is love, and the Father and the Son are said to love, but not the Spirit. So that's one point, very significant. Second, uh, the biblical images for this everlasting love and life that Christians enjoy are images that are used of or explained by saying that's the Spirit. So that's one. Next, several passages appear to speak of love and the Spirit interchangeably. So it's like we talk about, you know, you being in love and then, uh, you know, being in the love of God. And then it says, like, or like the love of God is in you. And then it says the spirit is in you. Right. So they're they're really, really close. <clears throat> and then next, um, because the, the persons of the Trinity indwell one another. Remember when Jesus said, like, I'm in the father and the father's in me. Uh, this is basically saying I'm in the father, the father's in me and the spirit's in the father and the Father's in the Spirit, and the, the, the Son is in you know, the Spirit, and the Spirit's in the Son. Uh, as Jesus was, you know, you can kind of see an analogy here where Jesus is in the world, and he's filled with the Spirit, right? Or we are filled with the Spirit. It's like that, but in the Trinity uh, itself. So, um, because of that, the Spirit is not an impersonal force residing in the Father and the Son. Rather, he is himself the bond of love in and between the Father and the Son. So, the whole objection to this is like, oh, well, so the Spirit's a force. So the Spirit's not personal. Um, but basically what this would say is that this is a way of communicating a relationship. The, this is a way of describing and kind of mapping out the life of God, the love of God. You have Father, the Son, and the Spirit uniting them in love. So that's um, kind of the intro there. But to move on, and then we'll get to questions. This is, I think, the best part. So what? Like, why is he saying this? Why does this matter? Edwards basically says that this model explains why the gospel is the way that it is. Like, why the gospel is the way that it is. He says, and I think he, there's a quote even in the footnote, it seems to me that what I have here supposed concerning the Trinity is exceedingly analogous to the gospel scheme and agreeable to the tenor of the whole New Testament and abundantly illustrative of gospel doctrines. So he's basically saying that what I'm getting at here is 
what appears to be the case with the revelation of God's character in the gospel. So, maybe another way to think of that, if we are invited into Trinitarian fellowship, right, where Jesus says, you know, like, let them be one with us as, as, as we are one, right? We're being invited in our salvation into fellowship. We stand in the place of Christ, right? And we relate to God as our Father, and we do so spiritually, right? I don't actually stand, we don't actually stand physically before God in that sense. Uh, we do not physically hold to Christ or stand in Christ somehow, uh, but it's a spiritual union that we have with Jesus. And so basically taking that and saying, okay, what does that help us understand about the Trinity itself? Okay, so basically, we're invited in to see what the Trinity is actually like. Um, that's the idea. So he's saying this helps us understand the gospel uh, and kind of articulate it. So seeing the Spirit as the bond of unity also helps us grasp the core idea behind how he's described. So I'll do a pause after this. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says God's grace gives us, quote, the fellowship of the Spirit. So the fellowship of the Spirit. This is one th way the Holy Spirit's described as, you know, giving fellowship, which is what Edwards would say is read that like a mirror. Read that back onto the Trinity. So where the Holy Spirit gives fellowship to the Father and the Son, basically. So Ephesians 4, 3, believers seek to protect the unity of the Spirit. Again, the Spirit is unifying in the bond of peace. Jude 19 and 20 says something really interesting. It says, you know, there's people who cause divisions in the church uh, and they are devoid of the spirit. Flip that around. Those who build each other up have the spirit. So the spirit is again, unifying um, people. Romans 5, 5 says the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So again, the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts. The love of God comes into our hearts. Jonathan Edwards would say, I think these are kind of the same thing. Um, the Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son. Romans 8, 9, the Spirit himself is the one who unites us to God in Christ because it says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So again, the Spirit is the link. Romans 8, 15, it's called the Spirit of adoption, right? He's the one who brings us into the family of God helps us cry out to God as Father. Romans 8, 21, the Spirit himself intercedes for us. Again, what a priest does to connect people with God. Uh, in Galatians 4, 6, again, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So the idea here is Jonathan Edwards is looking at salvation of, of people. He's looking at what the gospel affords people, which is fellowship with the triune God, where we stand in the place of Christ, we stand before the face of God to receive his blessings in Christ, and we do so spiritually united to both of them. And so he's saying, I think that is how we can understand how the spirit is actually distinct and why he's described in this way so many times in the Bible as the one who gives unity to us or the one who gives unity to us and God or something like that. So that's kind of the initial run. Questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, and the, yeah, there's like different scenarios, different scenes in the Bible or conversations like that where you have Trinitarian persons talking about one another. And it's like you can clearly see in that case, you know, Jesus is praying to the Father. It's clearly the Son is not the Father. Whereas there was an old heresy where people said it's basically one God who wears three different masks. You know, like sometimes he's the Father, sometimes he's the Son, sometimes he's the Holy Spirit. Uh, but there's scenes like at Jesus' baptism where he's baptized, right? The Son is baptized heaven opens, the spirit descends, and then the father speaks. So the father's in heaven speaking, the spirit is there, and the son is here. So you have all three um, mapped out for us. And so we know they're, they're distinct. And so is Jesus not able, was the Holy Spirit actually not able to come until Jesus was baptized? Yes. Yeah. 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 So that's, in the sense of, um, he is, so the, the question is, was the Holy Spirit not able to come until Jesus left, right? Um, in one sense, yes. Now, the Holy Spirit is God, and therefore he is everywhere, 
Um, but in terms of his presence, it's presence described as a kind of ministry, like a kind of presence, uh, a specific work that he's come to do. So in that sense, um, yeah, it's coming to indwell people. Uh, and the Spirit, basically, the Son has to go and then send the Spirit, um, is the idea. So the Son leaves, and he says, it's better that I go so that we may send uh, the Comforter, right? Um, so the general idea is that... Um, the Son, as the exalted King, now pours forth his blessings, his gifts, right? He led host, uh, captive a host of captives and gave gifts to men, right? He also gave uh, forth the Spirit, the spiritual gifts. Uh, and so the Spirit comes from Christ after uh, redemption is accomplished. And you can see that uh, in the passage, I think it's in John 20, uh, where it says that Jesus breathes on his disciples, and then said, receive the Holy Spirit. And it's in that context where he's saying, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And it's, it's giving you a picture to understand the Holy Spirit is coming from Christ himself to the disciples. And so, yeah, there's different kind of phases to the ministry. And now we're in an age where Christ himself incarnate is on the throne in heaven. And yet right now uh, we have the spirit of Christ in us. And then eventually we will be united uh, in a different way. But yeah, that's kind of an interesting chapter division in history. So, okay. Other questions? Yeah. think, yeah, I mean, there's there's descriptions of him. You say Genesis 1? Someone said Genesis 1. Um, where, you know, the Holy Spirit, or even, um, you know, the when Israel's moving throughout the, the wilderness and there's the pillar of fire, right? Now, the language there uh, has, you know, the angel of the Lord and things like that, but there's, there's definite spiritual things there. Um, so, yeah, I'm thinking any other Examples? Uh, no, like where the Spirit's manifested in the Old Testament. I mean, the burning bush, but that's also the angel of the Lord. I mean, the judges were uh, you know, at times empowered. Right? Yeah. Like, uh, right. Even Joseph was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. There's definite language of the Spirit's ministry, for sure. I'm trying to think of like a visible uh, designation where it's like, you know, like tongues of fire. Someone said like that. That's a clear like, oh, tongues of fire, Holy Spirit. Um, I mean, there's definite descriptions of him. Genesis 1-2, he's hovering over the surface of the waters, right? Um, things like that. Of course, you know, Spirit is wind in motion. Of course, Jesus says you can't see wind, uh, which is interesting because... Yeah, you know, in the sense, the Spirit's not meant to be, like, manifested in that way. Um, but, yeah, as far as physical manifestation or visible manifestations, can't quite think of too many. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, spirits are invisible, right? So, yeah, but definite, like, ministry for sure. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Genesis 1, all through the Bible, uh, empowering people you know, judges, things like that. So craftsmen of the tabernacle, definite stuff there. I think the manifestation is more the fruit of his work in people rather than the immediate uh, manifestation of who he is. So it's not so much, uh, yeah, anything but like him working in whether the weather or, you know, something like that. Um, but yeah, good question. Yeah. What was the first part? Is that done through something or the power of the Spirit? God or the Spirit? Yeah. Yeah, so I would say, yeah, definitely um, any miracle is done through the power of the triune God. Uh, and apart from, you know, so they're all there. 
all persons are there in every miracle. Um, and I would say specifically, yeah, like the spirit is the one enabling all sorts of things. For example, miracles, things like that. Of course, Jesus is our most familiar model of that where he gets the spirit and then does miracles. And then when they blaspheme what he does, he says, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit, uh, something like that. But um, yeah, I would say any miracle is done by the power of the spirit. Good. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so there's, a, let's see. So the question is, does the spirit have his own will or is he um, simply being used as a tool? Well, in, uh, I think it was the first page, we ran right by it, but uh, Acts 13 two, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, right? So the Holy Spirit's issuing commands. Uh, but again, this comes to the, um, the, doctrine of joint operations in the Trinity. Uh, so it's not like the Holy Spirit's like sneaking away, you know, like going to get Paul to run me an errand. You know, it's much more like uh, they're all uh, working in concert. And so uh, it's one divine will manifested in three persons. Um, that's how I would say that. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, basically. So the question is, do we stand in the place of Christ? Uh, can we clarify that? Uh, yeah, I would just say that is the language of being in Christ, right? So, so in the sense of not so much like we, we take his place and he's no longer there, but in the sense in which we are identified with him as his people, just as we are identified in Adam, you know, we are in Christ, uh, and therefore Christ is our advocate. Christ is the one who uh, speaks for us, goes for us, dies for us, rises for us, uh, leads the way. He's our forerunner there. And so when we are seen in the eyes of God, we're seen... Uh, in Christ. So we don't, here's an illustration for that. We don't approach, uh, we don't approach God as the father, you know, or in the father in that sense. We approach in Christ. We approach as sons. We are called children of God, right? In first John three. So, uh, we are, uh, united to God in the place of the son and not introduced into Trinitarian fellowship through the avenue of the father, for example, so we're ushered in, the Son ushers us in to receive the blessings of the Father by the power of the Spirit. So, good question. Yep. Yeah, so, so God is Spirit, right? John 4. Um, yeah, so this is the distinction of God in his essence is Spirit, and then the essence is uh, eternally existing in three persons. And one of those persons is most properly designated as spirit. Um, so it's, it's more relative to the other persons. It's not to say that the spirit is like the spiritual piece of the pie. And then the father is another part of the pie. And then the son is another part of the pie. God is spirit. Um, but in the relationship communicated to us of the triune persons, he is most properly designated as the spirit. So father, personal, son, personal, spirit, a person, but uh, described in a way that's more spiritual in language we understand. Sort of like back to the, you know, we have a spiritual bond with some of, someone, our friend or something like that. It's that kind of uh, place where he's locating the spirit. So, okay. Other questions? We can always come back. Okay. Yep. So, um, in the sense of, so the question is, yeah, so the, does the spirit only exist as a person between persons? Um, not really, uh, because the spirit is, Kind of like with us, the spirit indwells us. And so I understand that it can sound like there's distance uh, and the spirit's like in between. And that's, that's true in a sense um, as we talk about it, not really. But, uh, but yeah, the spirit indwells Christ. The spirit fills Christ. The spirit uh, comes from the Father, just like air in our lungs. You know, like the spirit is in us um, and, and yes, proceeds forth from the Father to the Son. Uh, but that's not to say that there's 
like inherent separation. They're, they're united, um, but what he's saying is if we were to just logically trace the relationship of love between the Father and the Son, that's what we would get. But not to say like the Father's over there, the Son's over there, and Spirit's like somewhere over here. Yes. Yes. So it's, it's logical space. Yeah. And also one thing we can sneak in here is like time, you know, like the father existed and then like they got the son and the son was created bad, you know, like it, this is all eternal. Uh, this is just us tracing out what has always been the life of God so that we can understand the life we're called into uh, as we partake of, of his life. So good. Um, for the sake of time, We'll dive into this question. Doesn't look like anyone brought tomatoes, but if the Holy Spirit's God, can we pray to him? I'm not going to say it's like outright defying the Bible, um, but there is an order in which the Bible does give us to talk to God. Uh, we always pray to the triune God. I think sometimes what people do without saying it or seeing it is they say, yeah, I want to pray to the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it's kind of like, oh, can't forget him. You know, like, I don't want to be the person who, like, excludes the Holy Spirit. Um, but every prayer we pray is a prayer to and in the triune God, right? So, so the, the Spirit is always there. The Son is always there. Um, so we're not leaving the Spirit out uh, by not addressing a prayer to him directly. The point is, um, I think it's, it's insightful to realize that of 66 books in the Bible, not a single prayer that I can think of is addressed directly to the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, you know, his disciples asked him, teach us to pray. And, and he said, right, how should we address God as father? Um, you know, and we pray in the name of the son. We pray to the father in the name of the son by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's the general model. There are a handful of exceptions. Uh, in Acts 7, Stephen prays to Christ in Revelation. A motto that describes their approach to unconventional warfare, it is, by, with, and through, right? By, with, and through. That's essentially the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you drop a green beret into a, a town, a village of, you know, 400 fighting age males who don't have any guns and don't have any knowledge of tactics, and the green beret is there to equip and enable them, right? So they're, they're, the green beret is there to mobilize that fighting force. Uh, their, their phrase is shape and enable. Shape and enable. Now, the really interesting thing I think about that is that's pretty much how the Bible describes the Holy Spirit uh, with his work of forming, shaping, and filling, which is enabling. So, shape and enable. That's why I say the Holy Spirit is basically the Green Beret of the Godhead. So, the Holy Spirit forms and fills. That is his general work. I would say that that continues consistently throughout both Testaments. So, if you think about what's the Holy Spirit doing, forming and filling. Um, you can see it in his name. Both the forming and the filling aspects of the Spirit's work can be detected from a consideration of his primary name or title, Holy Spirit. Uh, holy relates to his work of putting things in their proper order or, or forming things, having lines that are clear. Spirit relates to his work of animating all things or filling all things or enabling uh, life. So forming and filling, you can see it in his name. Uh, if we slow down and, and, and consider the words that were given from Scripture, you can also see it in his introduction. Uh, the categories of the Spirit's work of forming and filling are given to us on the very first page of our Bibles. Uh, it's actually awesome. Uh, God introduces us to the Spirit himself. Uh, he forms chaos into order, and he fills or enables creation uh, to live in the life of God. So think with me for a second. If you don't have your Bible, that's fine. You probably know it by heart at this point. Genesis 1.1, can somebody say it? Right, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the main theme, header, that as you open your Bible, is creation. God's work of creating something. Genesis 1.2, now the earth was what and what? Formless and void, right? Uh, I think uh, a helpful way to maybe tweak that a little bit is unformed and unfilled. Right, unformed and unfilled. So the spirit enters the scene um, when it's unformed and unfilled. It's there, uh, but the spirit is introduced, of course, in the next phrase. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was unformed and unfilled, and darkness was over the surface of the waters. And then who do you meet immediately? 
the Spirit of God, right? The Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So you have the theme, creation. You have the need, this unformed and unfilled world. And then you have the only agent who is given to you, right? We can like read the New Testament into it and all this kind of stuff, but the only agent actually called out in the, in the account in Genesis is the Spirit at this point by verse 2. Now, um, the Holy Spirit was hovering over the surface of the waters. That's uh, a word used in Deuteronomy 32 of a bird hovering over its nest. So again, kind of a personal force. It's not just like wind was over, you know, like inanimate or uh, you know, impersonal wind. It's, it's describing a person. Uh, so the Holy Spirit was hovering over the surface of the waters. And the Spirit is the only active agent in this case. So what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit... Uh, basically does a cosmic act of forming and filling, and then a personal act of forming and filling. So if you, you know Genesis 1, right? Uh, he's setting boundaries, forming boundaries between the sky and the earth or the sea, and then the, the water and the land, right? He's, he's setting distinctions. Uh, he's forming things, and then he fills those locations. He fills the sea with... Uh, you know, animals, he fills the land with animals, there's forming and filling on a cosmic scale, which tells you the Holy Spirit is behind creation and all of it. Uh, and then in the second account of creation, or the kind of zoomed in phase of creation, um, remember God is, is there to create man, and he forms him from the dust of the ground, and then, uh, you know, as we might say, filled, or in that case, breathed into him the breath of life. Uh, similar word to spirit, not the same, but similar. Uh, it's basically saying, cosmically, the spirit is forming and filling. Personally, the spirit forms and fills. So, um, Abraham Kuyper sees the spirit's work at this stage of creation as one of ordering, by which, I think it's beautiful, he says, the formless took form, the hidden life emerged, and the things created were led to their destiny. John Calvin wrote, the spirit, or the beauty of the universe which we now perceive owes its strength and preservation to the power of the Spirit. The, the point of it is the Holy Spirit is their uh, charging creation. Like the Holy Spirit's life is what animates the life of the world. Um, creation is not God. There's a distinction. We're not pantheists. Uh, but the Holy Spirit is the one enabling all of it to exist. So in the same way, I didn't put this in the notes, but in the same way that, um, you know, we say, you know, but I thought the word created or something like that. I thought, I thought, you know, in the beginning was the word and all things were made through him. That's true. Um, but in the same way that my words don't reach your ears without air between them, right? That, that word, that idea is communicated on the vehicle of air. Uh, that's similar. It's like God's the speaker, the son is the word, and then the spirit is the, the, the breathing out, the air, uh, which conveys all of that, that actually affects all of what God wants to say. So it's kind of like that setup where God is creating. But the point I want to get across is we often focus on the word in creation, and we should, um, but the spirit was was there. And actually, the spirit is introduced to us in Genesis 1 uh, as the agent of creation. Um, so really, really interesting. Uh, but questions while we're going on? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Hebrews one three. So. Yes. Yes. So so this gets back to the doctrine of uh, joint operations. So while we have three persons in the Trinity, uh, they're not separated, uh, but it's almost like they. Uh, I think it's called the doctrine of appropriations, where you know it, it's almost like it, you know. <laughs> This is an analogy. It's almost like you have different sides of God that you see, whereas like the Father might be the most forward in some action of revelation, even though when the Father's doing something, the Son's there and the Spirit's there. Um, or the Son may be doing something, but the Father's there as well and the Spirit's there as well. And so similarly, uh, the Bible will say, you know, of course, yeah, this Christ, you know, through him all things have been made. Apart from him, nothing uh, has been made, which has been made. Um, but in the same way that there's joint operations, uh, Genesis is kind of angling it to say the Holy Spirit is actually the one, um, you know, animating 
the world to be what it is. And so the word is there. Of course, Genesis 1-3, we're in Genesis 1-2. Genesis 1-3 is that God said, right, which is the word. Um, but, yeah, it is the, the, the quote-unquote energy of God which animates the world and gives life and forms things. And, and the mover uh, is the spirit, which is air in motion. You know, it's that, um, that aspect. So, yes? I think so. Uh, so the question is, did the Old Testament believer understand the Spirit's role in creation? Um, I think, you know, it, it, the, the Trinity is veiled in the Old Testament, but I would say reading back, you can definitely see it, um, where, you know, even, uh, you know, it says God is one, but the word for one is the same word used when Adam and Eve became one flesh. And so it's actually a multiplicity of persons in a union, and so it's not one like this, it's one, you know, as, as, a, as a union. And so similarly, when God is said to be one, he says, let us make man in our image uh, and, you know, things like that. It's like, okay, so there's different um, aspects there where you can kind of see that. But I, I don't think the, the personhood of the Holy Spirit really comes out as a unique person in the Trinity until the New Testament. Um, unless there is that passage in Isaiah right, where it talks about the distinct persons. I don't know. Yeah. There's a passage. Uh, no, it's it's in Isaiah, I think, and it's the Spirit. Uh, uh, it's like the... It talks about the Son and the, the Father and Spirit, and it's really interesting. Um, but... Right, yeah, yeah, definitely in that case, yeah, David is aware of that. Um, I think the the full-fledged trinity of, of three persons, one being in three persons, I think that probably wasn't as clear until you see Christ, the Son, revealed, and then how he relates to the Father and how he draws us into that relationship. But we can see that looking back. We have those categories now and we see it, um, but yeah, so yes, question. Hmm. Yeah, so um, the question is, is it is it proper to say that the Spirit is the agent of creation and the Son is basically the instruction uh, according to which creation, you know, comes into being? Um, because all three are persons, not quite. Um, however, I think Jonathan Edwards would basically say there is a sense in which that's true, uh, because the Son is the Word. He's that rational idea of God. Uh, and then the spirit is the affectionate love, you know, the energy, uh, that impulse uh, towards that idea of himself. Um, but yeah, I think I think the passages where you know, like John one and others, where it's like he's he's the one acting and doing these things. Um, yeah, it's I don't know, it's a good question. It's because you're kind of like splitting hairs with with yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if we could locate agency in one person. But I would say, um, you know, the in the joint operation, the spirit is the the animating um, motion. So, yeah. Yes. Question. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So is the spirit kind of an energy or does the spirit ever, there's kind of a few questions in there, or does the spirit make decisions on his own or, uh, yeah, kind of how, how those things relate. So I would say, while the Holy Spirit is a person uh, and the language is using, the, the language used of a spirit is communicating action. And, and I think someone said like the motion of the divine essence, you know, which is basically to say like God's, God's essence communicated in action. Um, and, and so there's a sense in which, um, yeah, I don't want to get away. I don't want to say the Holy Spirit's static, uh, but I don't want to also say it's impersonal energy, you know, like electricity and the, and the cables. 
Um, the Holy Spirit would never do anything apart from or on his own. There is no on his own in the Trinity um, because of the doctrine of joint operations in which they're all acting um, in concert. Um, but yeah, so I would say kind of wrapping that up, two questions, uh, two answers. You have um, the Holy Spirit would never act apart from the will of the Father, uh, but in, always in concert. There's, there's harmony of wills between... Um, or harmony of God's will revealed in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit acting. Um, and then, yeah, the Holy Spirit's not an impersonal energy, but the Holy Spirit is the quote-unquote active member uh, of the Trinity. So, yeah. Now, they're all there, and they all indwell each other, so they're all acting. But yes? Yes. What is it? <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, so there's at least some distinction there, right, between the members of the Trinity. Um, however, yeah, to say personhood of the Spirit, I don't know if that's quite the same. It's close, though. I think, yeah, so that's basically saying God sends his Spirit and his messenger. Um, but, yeah. Good. Other questions? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, does... Um, Um, so can the Spirit act on God's behalf without God commanding him? Um, the answer is no, because the God always acts um, as one being. And so the three persons are, are, are distinct within God's one being, but they're not separated. It's not like the Holy Spirit's doing this and the Son's over doing that and things like that. They're all together all the time uh, because they're united. They all have the same essence. Um, so... Yeah, there's no, this is a good point, yeah, to distinguish uh, that basically, yeah, um, how to say it, distinction isn't separation. So there's distinction we can identify in the members of the Trinity, but they're not separated. Um, so, yeah. Good. Up in the high altitude of Trinitarian discussion. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So is the is the distinguishing mark of the members of the Trinity the particular actions that they do? I would say yes. Um, the Father begets, the Son is begotten, the Spirit uh, proceeds, and those are distinct. Now there's concert between them. They all work in concert and harmony uh, and in a, in order. But yeah, that's how you can identify the different persons. So good question. Okay. Working ahead. So. Did Adam have the Holy Spirit before the fall, right? God formed him from the dust of the ground and then breathed into him uh, the breath of life. Uh, is If the Holy Spirit's already acting and you have a spirit understanding of, uh, you know, an understanding that the Spirit's there and part of creation, and then God himself is breathing into Adam, did Adam have the Holy Spirit? I'd say yes, um, but that's not the point of the passage. Uh, the point of the passage is to say that Adam received the breath of, of God, it's it's not the same word as spirit as in Genesis one. Uh, it's more of the the word of of simply the breath that makes someone live uh, biologically. You know, so it's not so much like the spiritual uh, moral life force, um, but it's it's the more biological life force from God. So um, the reason I would say that Adam was created very good, right? And that must mean that he is uh, morally holy, that he is morally good. He's created holy. He's not created neutral. He's created uh, with holy emotions in his heart, holy longings, holy uh, thoughts. And that holiness comes from God. And I think John Owen and others said, you can see it actually in the redemption of mankind, right? Uh, in Ephesians 4.24, it says, you know, put on the new man 
created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And so the new man is created holy. Uh, and we're supposed to put him on in that sense. And so realizing, okay, if, if the first man was holy, uh, it was the Holy Spirit doing that. So long way of saying you can't be good without God. So that's kind of the idea. Um, questions on that? Adam, Holy Spirit stuff. Sure. Uh, okay. What about? Wait for it. According to said concordance. Actually. Psalm 51, right? Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Interesting. Um, but, yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> well, concordance discussions are fun. Um, okay. Okay. Here's what I want to say. Yes. <laughs> um, I would say she was definitely saved uh, after the fall. And so this gets into the question of, did Old Testament saints have the Holy Spirit? I would say yes. Um, yeah, but I would say, and I actually have, I think, something here that speaks to that uh, when we talk about the language of regeneration uh, as a new covenant reality. So we'll get to that. But yeah, I would say you can't be good without God. Dead people can't live apart from the motion of God in their heart, apart from the life of God giving that. So that's more, um, yeah, I think the emphasis is more on the, the ministry of the Spirit, the specific ministry of the Spirit in some cases. But I would say the doctrine of salvation, uh, the mechanics of salvation can't change in that sense. So yeah, anyway, I have language to, to back that up for later on in this note packet. But Let's take a time, moving ahead. Um, here's what I want to say. The forming and filling of the material world is language that's picked up in salvation. So the, the forming and filling language of the first creation is the language of the new creation or the spiritual salvation that ultimately results in the creation of the new world. So as we look at the first creation... Uh, there's kind of this broader lens that we look at where, okay, we have salvation categories, right? Being filled with the Spirit, things like that. The Old Testament kind of takes that and sets it in the context of all creation and says it's not just personal, right? Genesis 2, he formed and filled man. But like Genesis 1, he forms and fills everything. And so the Spirit's doing literally everything. Um, so everything owes its life and ability to the Holy Spirit. The heavens, Psalm 33, 6, by the word of Yahweh, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Uh, the beauty of creation comes from God. Uh, by the breath of the heavens, uh, by, the, by his breath, the heavens are made beautiful. Uh, animal life, you know, in Psalm 104, you take away their spirit, their breath, uh, they breathe their last and return to the dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. So animals exist because the Holy Spirit is making that happen. Um, just as God makes everything happen all the time, uh, it is through the agency of the Holy Spirit uh, that Scripture says that this can happen. Human life, of course, Psalm 139, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. He did that spiritually. Uh, Job 33, 4, the spirit of God has made me. The breath of the almighty gives me life. Acts 17, probably one of my favorites. He himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And so literally, like the temperature in the room, the clothes on our back, the food in our stomachs, everything comes from God. Uh, and it comes from God through his Holy Spirit. Um, all flesh uh, is given life by the Holy Spirit. If he should set his heart on it, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would breathe its last together and man would return to the dust. Human skill and ability, even of unbelievers, 
Everything about everything comes from the Holy Spirit. Like Satan's existence is held by the Holy Spirit. Like Satan doesn't have existence of himself unless God gives him that existence. Uh, and God gives him that existence by the Holy Spirit. Unbelievers don't have the ability even to sin unless the Holy Spirit's enabling them um, or giving them that kind of power. Uh, human skill and ability. In Exodus 31.3 with the craftsmen to, fill the, or to uh, craft the tabernacle, he says, I have filled him, this individual, with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all kinds of craftsmanship. So it's awesome. Like any skill you have uh, was taught to you by the Holy Spirit. I think it's Daniel 2 that says like he gives knowledge to those who know things. <laughs> like unbelievers, brilliant scientists, completely like God-hating unbelievers, anything in which your brain works, uh, any forming, the correct forming of your brain, any uh, life in your body is given by God and, and God the Holy Spirit. So um, some amazing quotes there. The Spirit of God is the fountain of life and creation amid all its necessary changes receives from him, the Spirit of God, its renovating or rejuvenating power. The blossom and decay of vegetation, the succession of races on the earth's surface, the bias impressed on various minds, the skill in arts, the manifold gifts which hold society together are all the workmanship of the Spirit. John Owen says, thus the Spirit of God came upon Othniel with wisdom for government and courage for war. Thus God sent his Spirit on Cyrus, his anointed, uh, to qualify him for the mighty work he was to effect. Thus also Zerubbabel was enabled to build the temple, notwithstanding the strongest opposition, that it might be evident to all that the word was effected not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. And so the Spirit is enabling literally everyone to do literally everything. It's awesome. Uh, so much bigger than simply salvation. Uh, like cre the created order itself, the, the clouds in the sky, the, the dolphins in the ocean, everything exists uh, in and through him. So the application, recognize our dependence upon the spirit in all things and worship him, right? Uh, just like there's air in this room that we are all breathing, like the spirit is, is around us, you know, and in us and, and enabling us to live. Uh, we live on him, even in a non-salvific sense, but even just biologically. Um, yeah, we live according to his power. <laughs> okay, I will table that, and we can talk after. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, like the air we breathe. I mean, we are so dependent on the Spirit of God. So, it's awesome. Um, zooming through this. In the new creation, forming and filling language continues. Uh, the categories are consistent. As scripture unfolds, the language of creation becomes the language for salvation, right? If we are trying to try to understand what salvation is, God says it's a new creation, right? Uh, in both the personal and the cosmic aspects. As Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If I'm reading that with my Bible, how do I understand that unless I read the first part of the Bible and see what the creation was? I have to have some definition in my dictionary of what creation is, and that's in the First Testament. So, interestingly, uh, the, the pattern of actions that exists in Genesis 2 uh, exists in a new covenant passage in Ezekiel 37. So when, uh, you remember the Valley of the Dry Bones, right? There's the dead man, uh, the dead men, and they're formed together as bodies, and yet they lack one thing. They lack breath, right, to come to life. And it's the exact same pattern of action as Genesis 2, where God made man and his body, and then breathed into him the breath of life for him, him to become a living soul. So that pattern is there, uh, the similarities there. Um, and while it's similar to Genesis 2, the distinction, however, is that in the New Covenant, it's not just biological life. Uh, in Ezekiel 36, it talks about him, God actually putting his own spirit into uh, his people. And so it's a, it's a, it helps us understand this language of like spiritual regeneration, not like material life, like the first creation language helps us, but like moral life, like the the, the regeneration of our, our spiritual self uh, is based in language from Genesis. Um, and that's in a new covenant context. So we get the spirit of God uh, in the new covenant and it causes us to walk in obedience. So, um, yeah, why do we talk about being filled with the spirit? Why don't we talk about, you know, having our gears greased by the spirit or our brains, you know, boosted by the spirit? Why is the language something that 
alludes to something in the Old Testament because it alludes to the pattern of action that you understand from Genesis 1 and 2 um, of, of God giving his spirit, uh, breathing into man to make him live. And then he says, hey, you're dead, you know? And so what has to happen? We need to receive his spirit because life comes from God. And so it's not the flesh. It's not the flesh that does anything. It's the spirit of God that we need in us. Um, and that's, that's really what we get to here. Um, there's a, a different focus in the new covenant in the New Testament. Uh, but yeah, basically, again, the first creation passages focus on man's circumstances and really the material of his body. The new creation passages focus not on his circumstances outwardly, but on his spirit inwardly. So first creation forming and filling outside in, right? Forming the world and then forming man. And then there's kind of this like gap as far as we're concerned of like his spiritual state. It's not explicitly stated. There's kind of this gap there. In the new creation, it goes the opposite way. God gives his spirit in, and then it works out to where man walks in obedience, and then eventually the whole world's remade. So it's the opposite direction. Now, the point, in line with the flow of scripture and the progression of the covenants, the point is that we are to know that the outward renewal of things is not enough to overturn the fall, right? The flesh is not enough. Manipulating the flesh is not enough. We need the spirit of God in us. We need, you know, Adam died. He died spiritually, and then he died physically. Uh, he, he lost the spirit in that sense and then died. Um, and, and in order to be reborn, in order to be remade, uh, it's not just, you know, putting the rubble together. You know, it's not just, uh, you know, trying to like piece together the, the fallout of things. It's, we actually need to be recreated. Uh, and so it's patterned after that. It helps us understand that. Uh, we don't just need to change our circumstances. As Jesus said in John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. And of course, Paul is talking to all the Pharisees and things who, you know, who, as he was, who wanted, you know, circumcision to be of merit or something like that before God. He says, neither circumcision is, neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And he says, we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God, right? So it's the spirit of God that actually makes someone right with God, not anything fleshly, as we heard this morning as well. So the creation account in Genesis 2 is talking about, oh, here's, here's the circumstances of man. Here's how I make him. And then, as we know, Genesis all the way through Deuteronomy is one book. It goes to reveal, hey, guess what? You know what we need? We need the Spirit of God in us. And we have covenants to keep creation in place. We have covenants to keep you know, Israel in place. We have covenants to keep the line in place. We have covenants to kind of stabilize and stabilize and stabilize even a legal system of what we're supposed to do. And it kind of goes in and in and in and And then you realize, oh, but there's not a heart in the person, right? Like we have to have something there. And that's the new covenant is saying, I will put my spirit within you, right? And then it will cause you to walk in the law and all these things. And then everything gets rebuilt outward. So it's a big kind of like, New zooming in, and then like a shockwave uh, out of, of salvation. So this is getting to Gus's question. Uh, at this point, a taste of the future. Right now in the new covenant, only the inner spiritual dimension of God's new creation work has begun. So speaking of regeneration, right? We think of the new covenant, Ezekiel 36 and 7, God making someone alive again from the dead, regenerating them. Uh, that language is used in two lenses. One is personal and one is cosmic. There's a word for regeneration that only appears twice, and it's used in each of those lenses. Uh, in Titus 3, it's the individual way that we, you know, as a Calvinistic church would understand regeneration, right? Uh, the spiritual regeneration. But Jesus uses it in Matthew 19, and he's talking about that extended scope of the creation being regenerated. So regeneration is a bigger deal. I think that's kind of the focus of the, that uh, New Covenant passage is the kind of cosmic uh, focus there. Of course, the individuals mentioned, but I think salvation, I think the Spirit was indwelling and regenerating believers, but I think the focus in Ezekiel is the, the, the national and you know, geopolitical implications of that covenant. So um, right now we know there's an inward uh, you know, regeneration, an inward renewal, but it's our inner man who's being renewed, our outer man decays. And so we're at that beginning phases of it. Uh, Romans 8, we have the spirit, but our bodies groan and creation groans. And so it's like we just realize we're in this little part. You know, it's, a, it's going to grow, uh, but it, we're just in this little phase of the new creation work of God. So 
moving on, I'll take questions as we go. Um, notable works of the Holy Spirit in the New Covenant uh, Christian community. He causes the new birth. He gives life. Uh, anything forming and filling, anything to make a, a coherent thought or to give you life or ability to fight sin or anything, the forming and the filling of the Spirit is the same. It's just applied spiritually uh, and, and, and renovating us as people. So causes the new birth. He gives life. Uh, he illumines scripture. He opens our eyes to see things. He enables sinners to approve of biblical truth. He uh, tunes their, their moral compass. Uh, he convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Liberates men from sin and death. Sanctifies the elect. Advocates for and comforts believers. Testifies to the gospel as true. He renews mankind. Uh, he gives spiritual gifts. He's literally shaping an entire human being in the image of God. Uh, that's what he does. So forming and filling. And I think it's just sweet to realize, you know, when you know, when we feel like we don't have the power to do something or we feel like all our minds, our minds all scattered or our world's falling apart or anything like who do we need? We need God. We need the spirit. And because of Christ, we're given the spirit without measure. Uh, and so we, we have what we need. We have who we need uh, to fight sin in that way. And so implications, um, of course, Humility, um, gratitude, worship, confidence, love, and for the sake of time, um, yeah, those are those are benefits afforded to us, you know, by the Spirit. So, basically, summarizing, the Holy Spirit is the one who makes everything happen. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is God, uh, but the Holy Spirit is the one we need. Uh, he is He's uh, the power of God most imminent in our lives, and He's committed Himself, you know, as, as God is committed to remaking us. Um, so he's remaking people now, and then he'll remake the world in the future. So that's kind of the notes. Questions? Okay. Questions? No free will questions? I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your time. I'll pray, and we'll break. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's sweet to know just how provided for we are by your Spirit. Um, Lord, that he is in us, that he intercedes for us. Lord, we don't know how to pray as we ought. We're weak. We feel sin's pull in our hearts. Um, Lord, we, we don't see Christ clearly in our Bibles sometimes. Our minds are foggy. Uh, Lord, and it, there can be chaos outside of us and chaos inside of us. And yet, Lord, we know that your spirit, his work is to set things in order and to give us uh, the life that you have. So, Lord, uh, it's a sweet thing. We pray that you'd refresh us in that, to know that we have the spirit uh, or that he's in us and that we've been invited and ushered into the fellowship that, um, that you have. Uh, Lord, it, it's a sweet thing. And so, Lord, we pray that you would encourage us in that, that you give us courage uh, to fight sin and to be bold witnesses for Christ in our world. Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.